can consult the economic impact measurement and business strategy. I know with APPN, a lot of people on the network will be focused on impact investing. And when we talk about impact measurement, a lot of the time you'll be thinking about measuring the impact of, for example, a social enterprise is generating social impact in a slum or in agriculture or microfinance. In our case, the impact in this particular context is Standard Charter as a whole in different markets. So we are talking about the impact generated as a result of our lending activity. I would like to answer mainly three questions um, in today's presentation. One is that why did Standard Chartered choose to conduct a socioeconomic impact study? How have we gone about doing it? And finally, we've got the findings, so what, what have we done using them? And very briefly, what you see on the screen now is a um, summary of our system, but it's the agenda. Uh, hi, Yolanda. In this context, um, Yolanda, uh, sorry. Um, I think some of them yeah. have some trouble hearing you. So maybe if you could just try speaking even closer to the microphone or, um, yeah. I, I think maybe it comes across a little muffled to them. Sorry about that. Okay, let me just pick up the phone. All right. Um, I hope this is um, more direct. Yeah, yeah, sounds, at least it sounds better to me, but I was okay. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, going back to what I was saying, um, what you see on the screen now is a summary of our sustainability agenda. And the terms of sustainability and impact to us, we take a fairly holistic view of those words. What you see is we've got three core elements in our agenda, contributing to sustainable economic growth, investing in communities, and being a responsible company. The socioeconomic impact studies is really our attempt to quantify and also provide qualitative assessment of our contribution to the economies that we operate in. I think a lot of the times we get challenged by stakeholders when we say that banks do serve a social purpose. They will say, what exactly have you contributed? And they also want to know how much. We are one of the very few banks to have continued to grow through the financial crisis. And we've been very conscious of the need to stay focused on our core businesses. But we need to recognize that banks' reputations have taken a hit. And we felt that it was really necessary for us to consider and reconsider the fundamental roles of banks and to better understand our social and economic impact. But to answer the question why we've done the impact studies, I don't think reputation is the only reason, although it is one of the main reasons that we did the study. We also want to regain the public's trust. In our eyes, unlike reputation, which is based on, it could be a consumer's experience with a company or a brand, trust is something that is forward-looking. Uh, it's a metric of stakeholder expectations in the future. So while we would need to protect our reputation, trust is an ongoing process that we need to earn and reinforce. So clearly, financial institutions face a huge task to convince the world that we are changing and establishing some integrity in our operations. And those studies will serve that particular purpose. We also don't want to measure impact for the sake of measure, measuring impact and reporting. Have a report, put it on the shelf, and forget about it. We would like to use the studies, and we have been using the studies to explore ways to achieve this idea of a shared value uh, with society. It is um, a buzzword, um, the idea that what is good for society is also good for companies and their shareholders in the long run. And the studies, again, has given us some key insights that will inform our business strategy and also allow us to consider how we direct our resources, how we can match our commercial ob objectives with social objectives. The last point um, I want to make about um, why we've done it and some new features we've done with our latest report on Africa is that now we've been, uh, we know that a lot of the, um, of the public, they trust online search engines as much as traditional media when they're looking for general news and information about banks or companies in general. So with the latest studies, we've developed a series of online tools from interactive visual summaries to an app that people can download onto their phones. 
So in short, to answer the first question, why has Standard Chartered decided to do a socioeconomic impact study? I think there are three motivations. First, we want to understand the real impact we have on the countries that we operate in. Second, we want to use the insight gathered from the studies to re-evaluate the way we do business, to match commercial with social objectives. And finally, we think that we would be able to contribute to the debate on the social usefulness of banking and of standard charter in, in specifically, and in so doing, repair the industry's reputation and earn trust of our clients and the public. So far, it was since 2010 that we started doing this economic and uh, social impact measurement. We've done it in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, and earlier this year, it's on Africa, or the whole continent, with the 13 markets that we're in. It's, we are one of the first uh, companies to have done socioeconomic impact, impact studies, and certainly the first banks to have done it in these markets. What I would like to emphasize here is that it's an independent study. It's work conducted by an external team of researchers. Um, and that key, that's key to us, because we feel that that will give greater credibility to the report if they're coming from an independent third party. The consultants have chosen, they are renowned and well-regarded in this type of uh, measurement. We've adopted the methodology of the economic input-output model, which is a try-and-tested methodology. And we were asked by stakeholders that how can we fairly say that it is an independent report when it is funded by us? I think it's a fair question. Um, to us, the study is done by an independent team of researchers. The data that we provide to the consultants were only on our lending data, how much money is on our books rather than um, giving them the spin or the direction that the report needs to go. The researchers also use government national accounts in the input-output model. So again, it gives greater credibility to the data being used to, to come up with the findings. The reports themselves, um, it contains both qualitative and quantitative assessments, um, and you will see as I go through some of the visual summaries of um, the report findings, that we try to do both rather than just having a monetary value to everything that we do. Now, if you can allow me, there may be a slight lag. I would like to go onto the internet to show you the first report summary. So you should see on the screen very soon Yolanda, we can see it, no problem. It's a graphical representation. It's a graphical representation of the findings we've received on the Indonesian study, which was done in 2010 using our data by the end of 2009. And the methodology allows us to trace the flow of money starting with standard chartered on the left you will see different lines the color lines going to different sectors so we lend to sectors from agriculture to extractive manufacturing services in Indonesia the thickness of the lines represent the proportion of the lending going into the different sectors we also measure direct and indirect impact direct impact is the impact generated by our borrowers, by our clients themselves. The indirect and induced impact are the impact generated by our borrowers, suppliers, and their supplier suppliers. So we go down three tiers. All in all, in Indonesia, we quantify that our direct, indirect, and induced impact represents about 0.8% of Indi Indonesian GDP. Is a sizable contribution, and the contribution is made up of value added. When I speak of value added, it is a term that I would come back to several times during the presentation. Value added is the sum of three things: household income, company profits and savings, 
and tax income for the government. So we are taking into account not just the impact generated by our borrowers, our, the people we interact with directly, but also the supply chain. Through our operations, the bank creates employment value added directly in Indonesia. We hire workers, we buy a variety of goods and services in the local economy, and our employees spend a large share of their wages they earn in Indonesia. And the same with our borrowers. They would also have a ripple effect throughout this supply chain. If I can magnify this graph, so I can highlight one particular finding to you. You will see at the bottom right the value added per job graph. Here what I would like to highlight is it comes to us as a slight surprise, which is that governments often focus on impact and job creation being the proxy indicator of development, the number of jobs created. While that is the case, we find that if we say agriculture is the one sector that would hire and create the most number of jobs, in terms of value added per job, it's very low. And actually what the government should be doing is not to focus on job creation as the be-all and end-all of their policy. Governments should encourage employment in the sectors that create the most value added per worker and simultaneously seeking to improve the productivity in the low value added sectors. So this is one of the findings that we have taken on board and really consider how we can dedicate resources of the bank to encourage and increase the value added per job in sectors that would need it. For example, hotel, um, wholesale and retail in Indonesia and agriculture. Going on to the next study that we conducted, which was on Bangladesh. And you should see on the screen also is a similar type of graphical representation of the report findings. So it's really, instead of going through the 100-page report, this is what all the findings are about. We've been operating in Bangladesh for over 100 years, and we are the country's largest foreign-owned bank. When you think of Bangladesh, no other sector will exemplify the country's role in the global economy better than the garment industry. And you will see the circle, the third circle from top, the garment sector and the proportion of the lending that we make to the sector. The garment industry represents about 75% of Bangladesh total export earnings. There are about 5,000 garment factories in the country employing 2.5 million people. About 80% of them are women. So we know that our lending towards the sector, even though it may be quite small compared to other sectors, has a lot of impact, both social, environmental, and economic. And we found that our lending to clients in the garment sector generated a value added of $79 million and create over 30,000 jobs. Again, if I take into account the direct, indirect, and induced impact of our lending activities in Bangladesh as a whole, it amounts to about 1.5% of GDP in Bangladesh, slightly more than Indonesia. And I think that has to do with the fact that in Bangladesh, there is a lot more activities between the sectors. So in other words, there will be operators, companies operating in the manufacturing sector procuring from other players in the supply chain. Hence, there is greater value-added generation in, in the country. There are also qualitative findings in Bangladesh that we find was very encouraging. Um, we know that we are a pioneer in launching new banking products in the country, from having the first collateral free loan to SMEs, to having the first ATM, and now we have solar powered ATMs in the country. We also found that um, about 20 of our former employees, they have gone on to become CEOs and board members. Hello, Yolanda. Uh, are you there? I think you've dropped off. Uh, I can't hear you anymore.
I wonder if anyone else is experiencing the same problem. <laughs> Yolanda? Okay, yep, yeah, yeah. All right. Everyone can't hear Yolanda. So let's <laughs> give her another second. Hi. Yolanda? Uh, okay, back. great, you're back. <laughs> All right. Let's continue. I think you were just Sorry talking about. No worries. You were just talking about, uh, I think, 20 of your. Um, um, of the staff have gone on to um, boards of some companies, yes? Yes, so uh, I was just saying that about 20 of our former employees have gone on to become other banks in Bangladesh, they've become CEOs and board members, so we have been training a lot of talent in the country. Another thing, another sector in Bangladesh when you, um, that may be a fund of mind, is microfinance. Bangladesh is the largest um, single market in Standard Chartered for our global microfinance business. And we have been uh, making loans to the microfinance institutions in Bangladesh. About a third of that goes to agriculture. So our lending to other financial institutions, including microfinance institutions, um, that finding is embedded in all the sectors that you see here. So a lot of it would have gone into agriculture. Lastly, if I can go to the Africa study, which is our latest, and you will see that we've built in a few more interactive features in this summary. Again, we have talked about the direct and indirect impact, and I'll introduce something that is called an economic complexity of countries. Economic complexity essentially represents the diversity of a country's production and their export. So how much and how diverse are the products that are being produced in one particular country? In Africa, if I can show you one comparison, say if I go to Kenya, which, which is one of the four countries we've focused on, and if I click on our lending to the manufacturing sector, you will see that the dark blue segments, just over a quarter, are the direct impacts. So these are impacts generated by our borrowers. And more than half is indirect by the supply chain. If I compare that to Nigeria, so you see how the profile of lending has changed, and I'll go to manufacturing, it's a very different story you will see here that more than three quarters of the impact is generated by our borrowers, by our clients themselves, direct impact. And only less than a quarter of that is indirect. So very little value added from the supply chain. And this is the, the concept that the economists describe as economic complexity. While companies in Nigeria, they are very much vertically integrated because they can't rely on the country to deliver on the infrastructure and the logistics, and there isn't a thriving SME trade. The economic complexity will be very low, say in Nigeria. One of our clients that we featured in the report is um, the Parker Group, a big conglomerate. And what they have to do is that now they have to pump their own water, they have to generate their own power to the degree that they actually generate a surplus to feed back to the grid. They have to even have their own iron ore mine to supply to their steel manufacturing business because there is just not anyone to, to turn to in the supply chain. Whereas in Kenya, the SME trade is a lot bigger, a lot more diverse. There is a lot more procurement and trade amongst the sectors in the country. So while being vertically integrated is a good thing for a company, for the country as a whole, it is not um, a good indicator. The more economically complex a country is, the better the growth will be. Let me go back to the presentation, and I would like to summarize a little bit of the findings, and also to answer the last question, so what? So the last few visual summaries have shown you how we have gone about doing the study. And the last question is, how have we been able to use the findings to inform our business strategy? There are a couple of common themes in the impact study. The first is the importance of SMEs. I think it almost is 
quite glib to say that because everyone now knows SMEs are the engines for growth. And it was recommended to us by the consultants that we should increase SME lending, especially through supply chain financing, because that would increase the economic complexity of a country. We also should consider broader technical assistance to ensure that SME entrepreneurs that would get the financial education required to become savvy enough to access debt financing. We've made a commitment now to increase our SME lending by 45%. By 2018, we expect to have um, an SME loan book of about 30 billion US dollars. It's a sizable increase for a bank such as ours working in the emerging markets and also when in the face of regulatory requirements, many banks scaling back their lending. We've also found that one of the major barriers to SME lending centers around the lack of borrowing data. And Africa in particular is an acute problem. So we work with the authorities in Uganda and in Kenya. They both turned to us to um, uh, get a sense of how credit bureaus can be set up. And the two countries now both national credit bureaus of their own. In terms of technical assistance, we've also got SME education programs. We are hoping to reach about 5,000 SMEs across 10 countries in the next couple of years. Another theme that has come out of the impact study is how we can use our influence with governments to establish a pro-private sector environment. In Bangladesh, we have worked with our ready-made government clients to ensure that their operating standards meet international and environmental and social standards. Working with the governments, working with the international initiatives and NGOs on the ground to make sure that this will happen. We've also been able to talk to governments beyond the borders of the countries with funded studies. So in Myanmar, when we re-establish our presence in the country, we've been able to show, using the studies, how a healthy banking sector can really drive economic and social development. So I'll stop here. That will be the end of my um, presentation. All the reports and the visual summaries are available on our website, and I'm sure um, APPN will be able to circulate this to you if you want to dwell a little bit deeper on the findings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. My apologies for everyone for any technical problems along the way, and thank you also for giving feedback, because for most of the time, actually, uh, Yolanda sounds all right to me on our side. So, um, as I mentioned before, please submit your questions via the control uh, panel, the console under question, and I'll be able to relay this to you, Lander. Uh I've got a few questions coming in already, and actually the first question is quite specific. So, Yolanda, um, Leo here asks whether um, your impact studies and measurements uh, have any how should I say this, um, look at specifically uh, how it impacts women because in a lot of cases it, the impact is different on women as compared to men. So it, were your impact measurements reflective of, the, re reflective of this and how does Standard Chartered uh, address this? Right. We haven't really done it in a quantitative way but um, some of the qualitative assessment, we, it does point out the gender difference. And I mentioned in the garment sector in Bangladesh, 80% um, of the workers in the factories are women. So we know that the impact could be disproportionate between men and women in certain sectors. But in terms of the quantitative assessment, the numbers I've been uh, quoting, they do not have a gender lens. Okay. Understood. So. Question that just came in, how can you build social entrepreneurship in a country? Um, sorry, just let me reread this. Um, okay, sorry, the, the, I'm, I'm not fully understanding the question. Let me ask uh, another question. For a bank that is just starting about your sustainability practice and engagement, what would your advice be to 
I'm sorry. Uh, let, let me clarify some of these questions from our um, our attendees. So, Muriel, you, are you asking with regards to how can a bank help social entrepreneurs uh, grow? If you could just uh, respond on that, because I'm I'm not sure what you're referring to here. Right. Um. Well. Um, that is slightly different from the impact studies mm -hmm. that um, I've just shown here. But the bank does have an impact investing uh, business proposition, uh, including the business we have to microfinance institutions. So in addition to that, we've also been looking at ways to formalize our lending to social enterprises. So maybe that will be the social entrepreneurs the questioner uh, has in mind. Um, in Africa, for example, a recent portfolio review, we found that we have 150 accounts held by social enterprises themselves. And we know that um, when we speak of social enterprises, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and the type of social entrepreneurs we would be in a position to help as a commercial bank are the ones that are, um, they have a track record of about two to three years, um, and they, have, they may have some collateral then they'll be ready to assess commercial debt. Whereas there are social entrepreneurs who have just started out. Standard Charter's role here is more about providing technical assistance rather than lending. So the whole agenda on impact investing and helping social entrepreneurs, um, I think we look at it in the two ways, whether we can do business with them, and if not, how can we get them ready to be able to come to us for business. Okay, so there's been a few questions with regards to how the impact measurement was carried out, the process and the methodology, and if there were any baseline studies that were conducted prior to starting on the impact measurement program. Well, um, we are the first bank to have conducted similar uh, such studies, but we know that there are other multinational corporations which have done similar studies, and we take our inspiration from them. I think the key for anyone who is thinking about doing something similar is that um, it is quite a big endeavor, even though it is done by third parties. But you need to be clear about your objectives, and you need to really rarely support from your organization from different parts. So for us, for example, we have gone out to businesses, we've gone out to our brand and marketing teams, we've gone out to our um, strategy team to make sure that they are on board before conducting any studies. Um, and because they are part, of the, they own part of the study aspects of it, um, the whole implementation and using the findings to inform our strategy become easier. To give you an example, uh, we were quite surprised to hear that from the private bank, which we didn't expect them to be enthusiastic about the bank doing impact studies, were actually one of the biggest um, supporters to the studies because they, uh, a lot of the private banking clients were very pleased to see the report, especially a lot of our African private banking clients, to see the impact, the contributions the bank has made in their countries and not just being a foreign bank parachuting in and repatriating the, com the profits back. So I think uh, doing a study such as this, we need to really think about the stakeholders involved because that would make the post-finding implementation a lot easier. Okay. So um, with regards to this, there was also a, a more specific question with regards to um, how do you quantify um, the, the impact, especially with regards to the indirect impact that you've mentioned? Would you be able to walk through the strategy Sorry, or the methodology? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So the methodology that we've adopted to use is the economic input output model. The data that is used um, includes the government data uh, on national accounts and also Spanish Charter's own um, lending data, so to what extent and how much we've been lending to different sectors. What we haven't included in the methodology is our other banking activities such as advisory or equity investment. That hasn't been taken into account. But when we talk about quantitative assessment, with um, advisory services is a lot more difficult to attribute the um, input 
and how it feeds through to the economy to generate the value added. And as a result, we've decided to just take on one, sec uh, one product, which is lending, and that's our dominant activity, and to measure the impact arising out of that particular uh, banking service. Okay, so um, another question is on how you define the success uh, with regards to your programs. For example, how, what kind of KPIs do you set then? And then at the end of the day, what, uh, what is successful or how do you define failure? Okay, I think uh, the latter question, how do we define failure, is, uh, <laughs> is a good one. Um, I think with studies such as this, we are still in early days. We've done three, or in fact four studies um, so far since 2010. We're considering further studies and the future. We haven't really thought of establishing KPIs. I think the impact arising out of the publication or the conducting of these studies has mostly been about engaging with stakeholders who have an interest in standard charters. Mm -hmm. And that's the external facing um, objective. Internally, we have been able to uh, really use the report findings to match our commercial objective with social objectives. How do we direct resources to the right place? So for example, now in, for our product banking, one of the considerations for them when they think of engaging with their clients uh, from Africa is to talk about more than just art more than about um, uh, collection, is about, okay, the impact of the bank, of the industry, um, is more macroeconomic issues, and they are very interested in, in, in those aspects as well. Whereas for our multinational corporations, they're very interested in our supply chain financing, how that product can be shaped to increase economic complexity. And then thirdly, with our governments and regulators, we talk to them um, in a couple of the African countries, for example in Zambia, we now convene every two months a meeting between the public and the private sector to look at economic complexity specifically. So while they're not KPIs, um, and I do wonder whether KPIs will serve the purpose of uh, truly capturing the impact and the contribution from the impact studies, um, we have been able to uh, pinpoint many examples that we've done so. Okay. So another question relates to um, if Standard Chartered has any specific um, strategic program on engaging with NGOs or international NGOs because uh, despite all these financial programs out there, um, what they think is that a, a lot of uh, banks are still not able to reach the poorest of the poor in terms of uh, loans and uh, financing. So um, any, any strategy or programs from Standard Charter with regards to this? Okay, so I guess the question is more about financial inclusion and not just engaging with NGOs um, generally. Um, we I think it's two part, maybe. Program mm -hmm. established. Uh, right, so the financial education program we have we target entrepreneurs as well as women entrepreneurs in particular to get them to a place whereby they would be um, they would have all the financials to come to a bank they would know how to present to a banker um, for a loan there will be training such as that uh, financial inclusion definitely I think it is a difficult one for a commercial bank such as Standard Chartered that but it doesn't mean that we're not trying with um, some of the key markets, we work with correspondent banks to make sure that the um, bottom of the pyramid or the low-income communities could still be able to access financing facilitated by our lending towards those institutions. The other aspect of financial inclusion is our business with microfinance institutions. So even though our retail presence doesn't allow us to lend to low-income communities directly, by lending and also advising and taking MFIs to capital markets, we have been able to build the capacity of those institutions to on lend to their borrowers. So the relationship is one tier down, it's indirect, but it's still there for financial inclusion. Sounds fantastic. 
So the next question is with regards to whether Thanacharted um, uh, ensures that your programs uh, fit within national plans, especially in compliance with the Paris and Accra principles, to make sure that uh, your programs are not undercutting other programs. Any idea on this? So the question is, what programs not undercutting what programs? Um, whether Standard Chartered's programs are in compliance with the Paris and Accra principles so as to ensure that your programs will not undercut other organizations' uh, programs. Um, yes. I'm not familiar with um, those principles, so I'm, I'm afraid I won't be able to answer that question. Okay, no worries. So, I mean, I'm sure, uh, Dennis here, if you have uh, further questions with regards to this, you, you can send us an email on that and, and we can take the discussion further offline. Um, so, another question sure. is with regards to whether Standard Chartered would be able to share more with regards to the technical assistance provided to social entrepreneurs. Oh yes, we will be very happy to. So um, if you can send an email to Stacey, um, she can pass it on. We have, as I mentioned, an established financial education program and we'll be very happy to reach out to social entrepreneurs. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, so there's this command on how not all SMEs deliver social impact. How do you distinguish between SMEs that do create social value and those that don't? with the support that you offer to the SME sector through your Education for Entrepreneurs program? Okay, so um, one thing I did uh, uh, do a big caveat in the beginning of the presentation is that when we talk about impact in this particular context mm -hmm. of the studies, we're talking about impact um, uh, holistically rather than simply the impact generated by the SMEs which may be serving a low income community or making an impact on the society and environment that we operate in. So it's more, it's a lot broader. We didn't make any distinction in the impact studies between SMEs which may be considered social enterprises by some definitions and the SMEs which are simply generating economic impact by employing people and having um, economic activities throughout the supply chain. So that's the first point. So we do uh, have an impact investing business proposition and there we distinguish what would be considered social enterprises by our definition from general SMEs. So in our definition, a social enterprise must fulfill a couple of criteria. They must belong to certain designated sectors from agriculture, health, education, water and sanitation, or off-grid renewable energy. And the second criteria is if they also serve low-income communities. So we're not talking about SMEs which are uh, considered social enterprises in, in our context. We are talking about social enterprises which will fulfill these two criteria and then they would also qualify for other technical assistance. So that's the definition that we have. Very interesting. I, I definitely agree with that too because I think a lot of times um, we have to be clear on what we, uh, how we define social impact and uh, different organizations and uh, different, um, um, sometimes different platforms define it differently. So uh, another question is uh, please share some of your investing in communities programs and uh, do you also apply the same impact lens to these programs? Yes, so we have a few flagship community investment programs. The one that is biggest is our Seeing is Believing program, one to um, tackle avoidable blindness in our markets. So it's been a, a program that's been going on for years, for, for more than 10 years, and we've got um, a sizable budget dedicated to the cause. 
We've also got a financial education program uh, that I mentioned. Uh, it was started uh, just a year ago, and we are aiming to reach out to SMEs and entrepreneurs in 10 markets to get them to become financially savvy. We've also got a program on HIV AIDS education. Um, we've got a big presence in Africa and in Asia where HIV AIDS remains sometimes a taboo or really a, a problem that would affect our work and productivity. So we've got a program for that as well. I think all in all our community investment programs uh, will be considered by impact investors as purely philanthropic endeavors and that's quite true. Uh, some of the technical assistance will also be counted as just um, philanthropy. But we do feel there is a role for those programs to um, prepare entrepreneurs or to prepare, um, uh, so we've got also one additional program on goal on women empowerment, preparing young girls to be um, educated and to be able to assess jobs in the future. So um, we see businesses impact investing technical assistance and community investment programs going hand in hand. Okay, so the impact studies that I mentioned, the impact studies, however, they are with impacts of our lending activities, not the community investment, so not the community programs. Mm -hmm. mm. There's too many programs that we're speaking about right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, Taiwan is also asking whether um, the financial education program that you have uh, is extended to Chinese speaking areas, for example, in Taiwan. Um, I don't know specifically about Taiwan, but I can check. So um, I will note down the question. I can go back to the questioner. Okay. Now, one of the questions I've asked you before, what was Standard Chartered's greatest challenge encountered in going about measuring social impact? The biggest challenge? Yeah. Um, I think um, even though it is an independent study, it's done by a third party, it is a big endeavor, both in preparation, in, in the run-up to conducting the study, to after the study, what you do with them. Um, so I would say that the biggest challenge is don't underestimate the level of work required. Um, don't think that just because it's something done by someone else, um, uh, uh, there is some work involved by the organization itself. Um, we've done a lot of work um, in Africa. The biggest challenge was reconciling the lending data with the national account because there are some discrepancies and that took months um, in the project timeline. Uh, with Bangladesh and Indonesia, I think they were the first two studies that we did. And the biggest challenge there was to get senior management to support such an idea. We are the first bank, we are one of the first companies to do similar studies. Um, and in the beginning, it was quite a novel idea in 2010. Um, and we also worry that the study will be seen very cynically by our stakeholders. So we have to really convince senior management of the value of the impact study. And we've seen that um, as a result of the first two, we have proceeded to do further studies and now considering new studies ourselves, that um, management does see value in them and it's not just a report being done and then put on the shelf. Yeah, a lot of hurdles that you have to cross in order to get this done. So definitely, um, I'm, I'm, I've got my heads off to you on that. Um, I have another question now. Do you see links between the impact investment business and the community investment uh, programs with regards to your CSR as a way to build a pipeline of investable opportunities for your impact investment business? Uh, yes. So um, I think uh, I mentioned before that we do see our community investment program, especially the financial education program, as a potential pipeline for social enterprises getting ready, establishing a track record, and establishing their financial statements well enough for us to consider. Um, and uh, I think for the bank, where we operate in Africa, in Asia, in emerging markets, impact investing um, doesn't make sense to us commercially. So we just 
need to find the niche whereby we can identify social entrepreneurs uh, that we as a commercial bank can bank. Mm -hmm. So on getting senior management buy-in that uh, you were talking about earlier, how were you able to convince the management of the value of the impact studies before the results were out? Um, first, it was helped by the fact that uh, there were a couple of multinational corporations which have done similar um, uh, studies, and we were able to show the value they have got from them. Um, Unilever being one of the leaders in not just in the world of sustainability, but in really thinking about shared value. Um, I think we were also blessed with senior management that has the foresight to see the value to um, repairing the reputation and regaining the trust from the public for the industry as a whole and for standard charter specifically. Um, we were perhaps preferably helped by the global financial crisis that uh, the banking industry's reputation has taken a big hit and um, the, the studies go a long way to repairing that reputation. Mm, fantastic. I think it's a combination of being at the right time and having the right people on the project that really help ev move everything forward. So I think I still have a, a bit of time for another one or two questions. Um, if anyone would like to submit more questions on this, if not, um, I think Yolanda can take a short break right now. Let me see if there were some questions that, that, that I've already missed. Actually, there's a lot of questions that came in, uh, but some of them came in piecemeal. So it's a little bit difficult for me to string this into one coherent question right now. If uh, anyone would like to submit your sh question in a really succinct way right now, that would really help. Okay, I have a question here asking if you could explain um, the economic complexity that you've mentioned a few times a little clearer in. Sure. So the concept of economic complexity, that represents the diversity of a country's production and their exports. Using the example that I made um, during the presentation between Kenya and Nigeria, Kenya is considered a lot more complex than Nigeria because there is a lot more uh, activities, economic activities in country between different sectors. So, for example, there will be the farmers in agriculture producing um, um, cocoa, and then cocoa goes into a manufacturing plant for processing into chocolate for trading and retailing and export. So that involves several sectors in one country and value added is created as a result. In Nigeria, economic complexity is a lot less. So again, using the example I mentioned, the client, uh, which is a big conglomerate, they have to do everything themselves. That's because there is a lot less of a supply chain for them to turn to. So they have to have their own mine, to mine their own iron ore, they have to pump their own water, etc., etc. And for a country as a whole, the lack of economic complexity would hamper their future growth. If you think of it as um, the rise of the SMEs, SMEs are known to be the drivers for economic growth. And in Nigeria, SMEs are a lot harder to survive because companies, the large corporates, do everything themselves rather than farming out the contracts and the procurement to the supply chain. And that's the opposite to the scenario we have in, in, in Kenya. And that's why economic complexity is often used as an indicator of um, the future growth of a particular country. Okay. Um, so Yolanda, I have an interesting question here for you from one of the attendees actually. He's asking, 
whether you would want any feedback on your program from the attendees. Uh, oh, uh, well, I need any feedback from, from all of you? Yes, definitely. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I think I, he means more uh, more with regards to the to education program. Yeah, to the program. Yeah. yeah. If, uh, for example, you wanted them to to comment on what they thought uh, as part of the sector, what they felt on your your the, the programs, the impact measurement that you've already done, I think that's what he was referring to. Okay. Um, yes, I think I've only shown you um, uh, something that is quite limited and a snapshot of the impact studies that we've done so far. So please do go on to our website. Um, pick one country that you are most interested in and um, give me the, the feedback. Um, the Indonesian and the Bangladesh one was done in 2010. The Africa one was done early this year. So you may want to pick the latest one or if you are only interested in Asia, the Asian countries. Uh, either way, I will very much welcome your feedback, especially um, on ways that we can help um, in using our influence, our leverage with our clients and with governments and regulators to make sure that there is inclusive economic growth. That sounds fantastic. So um, I hope everyone will also go to the website and take a look at the reports so you can give more uh, constructive and feedback to both ABPN and to Yolanda and Standard Chartered. Actually, there's quite a few people who've uh, mentioned that they would like uh, a copy of the slides and presentation. We'll, we'll see whether we can get that done. But besides that, um, I think uh, we'll come to the end of the, the presentation now. And with that, we'll also put up um, the webinar recording on our website by end of the week. So I want to thank everyone for this very insightful session. And our next webinar will be on social investing landscape in Asia, uh, sorry, in India, with presenters from an event and other platform. This will be held on 6 November, so please visit our website's event page to register for it. And thank you for your engagement. So thank you again, Yolanda. Um, thank you so much for your time and the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to our next recording and session again. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.